The other big thing was uh, William Lane Craig. And let me just dive into this real quick because I want to get to the phones. I am a great admirer of yours, despite being a non-religious theist myself. For the sake of full disclosure, I have never been able to bring myself to take atheism seriously, and I'm convinced on purely philosophical grounds that the atheist worldview is consigned to logical absurdity. That said, I have never been able to bring myself to subscribe wholeheartedly to any religion either, and this for a variety of different reasons, depending on the religion under discussion. However, since you are a Christian, I will limit myself to the principal reason why I cannot bring myself to accept Christianity, to which I have yet to receive a satisfying response. I figure if I won't get a compelling answer from Dr. William Lane Craig, then most likely no such answer is available, at least for now. Oh, <clears throat> okay. Um, so here's, here's the, the issue. The root of my problem with, with the Christianity, I, I think it's probably just with Christianity, and all the Abrahamic religions, that matter, leads back to a number of Old Testament accounts, in particular the book of Genesis. I've listened to all 21 parts of your Defender series on the doctrine of creation. However, when I read the book of Genesis through, as I've done many times, based on the various exegetical analyses I have reviewed of the Genesis accounts, I find it very difficult to avoid the necessity of a literal interpretation. <laughs> very good. The first two chapters concerning the creation account, first the whole world, then of man, seems to afford some scope for a non-literal hermeneutic, but even if this were so, that still leaves me with the whole wild account of Noah's Ark and the Deluge, the inordinate life expectancy of the first men for which some reason decreased with each generation, not to mention references to the existence of giants and accounts of women copulating with evil spirits, Genesis 6-4. Well, there's more than one way of interpreting that. Among many other things uh, that I've no, um, uh, th which I've no doubt you are aware. These accounts incorporate very specific language and do not seem to lend themselves to figurative interpretation. Now, I know I could dispense with belief in biblical inerrancy, which is what you usually propose to those who, like me, have confronted this stumbling block to faith in Christ. Hmm, that's interesting. However, if I concede that the book of Genesis as a whole, or a significant portion thereof, is not true, then that leaves me with the awkward fact that Jesus Christ, the deity to whom I would owe my allegiance, on more than one occasion affirmed these errors as truths. Luke 17, 26, Mark 10, 6-9, Matthew 19, 4-5. I hasten to add that Paul in his letters reiterates many of these affirmations. The only way it seems to me one can resolve this problem is by saying that Christ affirmed these truths in a metaphorical sense, but I find this justification unsatisfying, mainly because the most reasonable interpretation of Jesus' words is that he really did believe these events were literally true. If you say that the Gospel writers misquoted Jesus in all these counts, then that raises the question of what else they might have got wrong. Needless to say, that strikes right at the heart of the Bible as a whole. Smart guy. Now, your response to this would probably be that none of what I have said above detracts from your historical case for Jesus' resurrection. That is true, although it also means that I am left with this one argument for an event which supposedly took place 2,000 years ago upon which to erect the whole rational foundation of my Christian faith. It's an awfully heavy rational burden to sustain for just one argument. However, even, I think it's probably even if, I were to acknowledge Jesus rose from the dead, it seems to me that I am not in a position to know for certain what God wants from me, since his repository for truth is in effect fundamentally tainted and therefore can't be trusted. So here are my two questions for you. One, if I reject biblical inerrancy, what use is the Bible to me as a Christian? More specifically, what epistemological referent am I left with to determine whether certain aspects of my would-be Christian faith are true or untrue? Am I to be left only with the voice of conscience? If so, this does not seem to be a position too different than the one I am in now. Secondly, what is your position on the other accounts in Genesis besides the creation account? In particular, I am interested to know your thoughts on Noah and the flood, since I do not believe you have ever directly confronted this question. I would like nothing more than for you to resolve this conundrum for me, since I do have a very special affinity for the Christ figure, and would like nothing more than to believe that it is true. Many of my non-religious friends and acquaintances have confronted this same problem vis-a-vis -vis Christianity, and I would love nothing more than to be able to refer them to a compelling answer. God bless John in Malta. Wow, John in Malta. I hope someone refers you to this program. 
fascinating insights into the very criticisms that I've been making of the William Lane Craig, Mike Lycona, Andy Stanley, mere Christianity, all you need is the resurrection. You don't need to really know what it meant or why it was necessary, and you don't need all those prophecies and all the rest of that kind of stuff. And let's just close our eyes to the fact that Jesus' view of the Old Testament is not the view of the Old Testament that we're actually most comfortable with today. And, and uh, let, yeah, mm -hmm. there you go. And by the way, I didn't write this. <laughs> I just want you to know. I had nothing to do with it. Um, nothing to do with it at all. Uh, all right, so here, here comes the response. At least I think this is. When people ask me what unanswered questions I still have, I tell them, I don't know what to do with these Old Testament stories about Noah and the Ark, the Tower of Babel, and so on. So I find myself in the same boat as you, John. I don't have any good answer how to resolve these problems. Yet these unanswered difficulties have not kept me from Christian faith or from abandoning Christian faith. Why not? Well, I stop immediately. I just, I just want to hear... I want to make sure people hear that a man that many people consider to be the leading Christian apologist in the English-speaking world, when faced with the obvious reality that the one he says created all things, the one that he says he himself is dependent upon for his own personal salvation, clearly believed these things and taught these things, that when faced with those issues... He's left going, I, I, I don't know. Now, don't get me wrong. I recognize that in our secular, rationalistic world, the existence of supernatural events in the past is considered to be foolishness. But that's what the resurrection is. It's a supernatural event. The virgin birth, supernatural event. I guess that's why we noted earlier that Ah, don't worry about the virgin birth thing either. You know, just all we need is one supernatural event. Well, John recognizes, well, that's an awfully slim basis for this whole big thing I'm supposed to be believing. Yes, there were supernatural events in, uh, in the past. Uh, and there was a reason why those supernatural events took place then in opposition to at other points in redemptive history. So you see, when you have a decree of God, when you have a God who's working things out in a particular fashion, um, then you have a basis for saying that there is a reason why there were supernatural events taking place in the establishment of the covenant people of God or at creation itself and things like that that would not be normative in other situations and other in other places along the, the, the line of redemptive history that is under God's sovereign control. It's not just, you know, here's a place where not only your standard synergistic systems can't really hack it, uh, but Molinism can't either. Because remember, you know, yeah, God's working out a particular plan, but it was the one that the card, the guy dealing the cards gave him. You know, he ran all the numbers. This is the best I could do. Here we go. Not exactly a firm foundation either. And it's something about uh, theology matters. Yeah, theology matters. Well, a large part of the reason, as you note, is that the truth of what C.S. Lewis called mere Christianity <clears throat> doesn't stand or fall with such questions. Mere Christianity denotes those central truths of a Christian worldview which evidently do not include the supernatural characteristic of Scripture. If a person believes that God exists and raised Jesus from the dead in vindication of his allegedly blasphemous personal claims, this says clams, but I'm sure they mean claims. We could do something about textual variants there, but we won't. Then one ought to be a Christian, and the rest is details, a matter of in-house debate among Christians. Now, I stop right there. Stop right there. I reject that. Absolutely. And I call on everybody else to reject it too. That's not the Christian faith. You cannot minimize the Christian faith like that. It, it, it doesn't work. And John sees it doesn't work. Listen, listen to it again. If a person believes that God exists and raised Jesus from the dead, who's Jesus? Who's Jesus? Shh, 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 don't, don't, mm, mm, ah, mm, mm. No, just raised Jesus from the dead. 
in vindication of his allegedly blasphemous personal claims. That's actually a part of the mere Christianity part? Then one ought to be a Christian, and the rest is details. So, the entire gospel is details. The whole thing about atonement and sacrifice and forgiveness of sins, and it's details. Just uh, in-house debate among Christians. Hey, if, if that's all you got, if, if, if that's your position, you're going to defend the Christian faith very, 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 very differently than I am. I also don't think you have any right to call that the Christian faith. But there you go. Um, questions about the historical reliability of these ancient Jewish texts, which Jesus called God speaking. Believe in Jesus, just don't worry about his view of Scripture. <laughs> I'm sorry. But sometimes I feel like I'm living in an alternate dimension here, you know, when, when, I, when I see people saying things like this. <sighs> Questions about the historical liability of these ancient Jewish texts just has no direct bearing on whether God exists or Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. Can you imagine any historian denying the historicity of some event in the Gospels because, say, the story of Babel is a myth? Well, now what did Jesus do? Um, well, you've just made the stories in the Gospels completely disconnected from the very redemptive history that the writers of the Gospels say they're a part of. What, what are you going to do with this poor person once you cajole them into some kind of, uh, of free will decision? What do you, what do you give them then? You've got no foundation. You've chopped everything up into pieces already. <sighs> Moreover, I'm persuaded that we have really solid reasons for thinking mere Christianity to be true. So what that means is, but we don't really have solid reasons for thinking the fullness of Christianity is true. Um... Moreover, I'm persuaded that we really have solid reasons to think mere Christianity to be true. When I debate other philosophers on God's existence, I find myself thinking, wow, these arguments really are powerful. The historical credibility of the Gospels commends itself increasingly to historical scholars. It just amazes me that the central facts undergirding the inference to Jesus' resurrection are accepted today by the wide majority of scholars, and the flimsiness of the objections of skeptical scholars is shocking. Well, here again, you have the appeal to majorities and to scholarship, which, of course, goes both directions. All depends on how you want to define scholarship and who, where you want to draw the line as to what the percentages are and everything else. I wouldn't worry that this leaves us depending on just one argument for something that happened 2,000 years ago. I would. I think John's exactly right. John recognizes this uh, minimum facts, mere Christianity, resurrection alone thing, leaves you with nothing. You can't ask who Jesus is. You can't ask what redemption is. You can't talk about the gospel. You can't talk about resurrection. Union is that, 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 that's all sec secondary stuff. Secondary stuff. The crucial time gap is between the time of the original events and the time when they were recorded, not between the time they were recorded and today. Well, if you mean textual, okay. Good evidence doesn't become bad evidence just because of the passage of time. So long as the gap between the events and the recording of them is short, it doesn't matter how far into the past both the events and the records of them have receded. Moreover, it's misleading to say this is just one argument. We're talking here about historical records of the life and teachings of Jesus that are far better than what we have for many of the major figures of antiquity. Well, that's true to a sense, you know, as long as you accept the uh, testimony of, of the Gospels, but you've got a problem if you don't accept them as inspired records, because then you take the John Dominic Crossan route, and you really only have one testimony, Mark, because Matthew and Luke are just following him, and John's unreliable. There you go. Um, 
once we once we finish this up, once I finish reading this, we'll start taking your phone calls. 877, well, you're taking them right now, I guess, from what I'm hearing in the other room. Uh, let me look here. Oh, yes, look at all those. Woo-hoo. Um, 877-753-3341. Uh, and as you note, uh, Jesus of Nazareth is an incredibly compelling figure in his own right, whom we ought to take seriously rather than dismiss. In fact, I'd want to turn the tables on you and say that you're placing an awfully heavy burden on just one argument, namely Jesus' citation of these Old Testament stories as a basis for denying either the historical credibility of the Gospels or the inference to Jesus' resurrection. Ugh. I've tried to, I've tried to block those that, that particular uh, sales pe- people. And, I've even stayed on the line. And then they just hang up on you. Anyway, um, look, I, I think you're totally missing, at that point, Craig totally missed the point, and John has it right. Jesus' citation of these Old Testament stories is a part of the very fabric of Jesus' view of Scripture. You can't just dismiss that. And it goes directly to his credibility as an individual. But, then notice where we go from here. Remember, William, William Lane Craig is Christologically weak. Uh, I mean, heretical in being uh, some of his rejections of certain things. The most important move you make dialectically is exploiting the Christological implications of rejecting the historicity of the problematic Old Testament narratives. Your claim is that since Jesus evidently believed in the historicity of these stories, then if we allow that these narratives are not historical, we allow that Christ has erred. But what are the Christological implications of that? Now, that's a really good question, which theologians need to explore like they've never explored it before. (laughs) Did Jesus hold false beliefs in his human consciousness? Did he think the sun goes around the earth? Did he think the earth was at the center of the universe? Did he think that there were any stars beyond those we can see at night? I'm not going to try to answer those questions, but I think they're worth asking. Did God stoop so low in condescending to become a man that he took on such cognitive limitations that Jesus shared false beliefs typically held by other ordinary first century Jews. Uh, Calling Dr. Kirk, only a few of you know what I'm referring to there, it has nothing to do with Star Trek, by the way. Since I have good reason to believe in his deity, as explained above, I don't know what the explained above was, to be perfectly honest with you, I would sooner admit that Jesus could hold false beliefs that ultimately don't matter rather than deny his divinity, rather than impose on him our a priori conceptions of what divinity implies, we need to be open to learning from the Gospels what the Incarnation entailed. Now, just think with me for a, for a second here about what's really being said here. Somehow, now we're being told we need to be open to learning from the Gospels what the Incarnation entails. Remember when Mike Lycona is saying, I'm just, hey, I, my view of Scripture, I'm just open. I, I don't want to be boxed in by inerrancy. I'm just, I'm just open to learning from the Gospels. Same stuff here. Please, someone, somebody, explain to me. How can you learn about the implications of Jesus' deity and humanity in the hypostatic union from books that are nothing more than mainly reliable historical records? How do you do that? You can't do that. The impossibility of a non-divine revelational source at the heart of this mere Christianity movement exposed by that one consideration. Exposed by that one consideration. In any case, I don't feel pushed that far yet. 
I think the texts you cite for showing that Jesus held false beliefs about the Old Testament are fairly weak. Mark 10, 6-9, Matthew 19, 4-5, for example, are just quotations from Genesis about the purpose for which God created man and woman. Uh, no, they aren't, Dr. Craig. May I, may I allow the non-Christian theist to refute your horrific handling of inspired scripture? You can look at Matthew chapter 19 and say it's nothing more than quotations from Genesis about the purpose for which God created man and, wo- and woman? Jesus said, these are the words of God. He takes the scriptures more seriously than you do. Oh my. So your only example of any force is Luke 7, we've got laughter in the other room, is Luke 17, 26 to 27, where Jesus says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so too it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They're eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed all of them. But this reference, like Jesus' reference to Jonah, is compatible with citing a story to make one's point. I might say to someone, just as Robinson Crusoe had his man Friday to assist him, so I have my wife Jan to help me, without thinking to commit myself to the historicity of Robin Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe, sorry. Um... I know, I know. It um so what you're saying, Dr. Craig, you see, if you said that, your audience all knows that Robinson Crusoe is fiction. So are you actually suggesting that Jesus operate on the basis of assuming that his listeners thought that Moses is fiction? Do you think Moses is fiction? We seem to have New Testament examples of this phenomenon. For example, Jew 9 mentions an incident in the Assumption of Moses, an apocryphal work which was never part of the Jewish canon of Scripture. That's true. Um, There is no question that the inspired writers can make reference to stories that were prevalent in their day. No, No problem. The Jews recognized that the assumption of Moses was not scripture. So they would not be confused by it. None of that addresses the reality that every single time Jesus quotes from Moses, it is God speaking. Do I need to remind you of Matthew chapter 22? Have you not read what God spoke to you saying? And then he quotes from the Pentateuch that this is God speaking. And so much so, God speaking, that he holds men 1,400 years later accountable for God having spoken it to them. That's not the same thing as you have with a reference to a popular religious work of the day to make a point. 1 Timothy 3.8 makes comparison to a couple of characters named in Jewish Targums, Dead Sea Scrolls and Rabbinic Traditions, which were similarly never part of the Jewish canon. Yeah, but they were names given to individuals who, well... There, to a story that takes place in the Pentateuch. Are you saying that the story is likewise fictional? Such comparisons do not commit the authors to the historicity of the characters or events. We may have something similar in Romans 5, 7, where Paul says, Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. I do not see that one at all. Sorry. Simon Gathercol, a fine New Testament scholar, points out that Paul is appealing to a common motive in Greco-Roman culture of someone stepping forward to die in the place of another. Uh, the most famous example in antiquity was Alcestis in Euripides' play uh, by that name who volunteered to die in the place of her husband, King Admetus. Alcestis was celebrated for centuries, and her name is to be found even in epitaphs on Christian graves. Gathercol thinks that in Romans 5-7, Paul may actually be thinking of Alcestis. He says, in effect, Alcestis was willing to die for her beloved husband, but Christ died for his enemies. So saying, so saying would not commit Paul to the historicity of this purely literary figure. As if anyone in the audience didn't already know that. The, the huge chasm here is that Jesus doesn't treat the Pentateuch and his audience does not treat the Pentateuch or view the Pentateuch as fiction. In any case, 
having utterly failed there. In any case, how can we be sure that the Old Testament stories are false? Well, that might have been a good place to start. (laughs) Several years ago, an article caught my eye about two secular geophysicists who think the flood of Noah could have been a catastrophic local event caused when the Bosporus Straits, which were formerly closed, opened up, causing the Mediterranean Sea to spill through and create what is today the Black Sea. I never cared to look into it because, as explained above, I just don't think it matters much. But maybe something of the sort really happened. Wow. (laughs) What? Can someone explain to me, please, 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 why someone who thinks that death itself can be defeated in the resurrection thinks that a worldwide flood is such a big deal? All right, so I'm not convinced that the Christological consequences you fear are so drastic as you think. Well, I'm sorry, uh, John, uh, you're not going to buy this, and you shouldn't. Uh, so as to your specific questions, okay, there's only, this is the last, last section, then we're going to go to the calls. I'm sorry. If I reject biblical inerrancy, what use is the Bible to me as a Christian? More specifically, what epistemological referent am I left with to determine whether certain aspects of my would-be Christian faith are true or untrue? Response he's given, I'm not advocating that you reject biblical inerrancy, but if you do, the Bible would be of use to you as a guide to theological truth. Galileo wisely said that God gave us the scriptures to tell us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. The great literature of the world shows us that works which are non-historical, like the plays of Shakespeare or the novels of Dostoevsky or the fables of Aesop, have important truths to teach us. It wouldn't follow from the non-historicity of certain Old Testament narratives that God's repository for truth is in effect fundamentally tainted and therefore can't be trusted. We know, for example, that the Gospels are credible historical sources, whatever you think of the early chapters of Genesis. Just use good principles of biblical interpretation and follow the evidence where it leads, while retaining an attitude of humility. And number two, what is your position on the other accounts in Genesis besides the creation account? As explained, I don't know what to think. Like you, I am baffled by some of them. I accept historicity as a sort of default position, but I have an open mind. I can live with uncertainty, confident in the truth of mere Christianity. It's at reasonablefaith.org if you're sitting there going, no, you're making this up. No, no, I'm... It's the day we live in. It's the day we live in. And you need to understand the impact this kind of stuff is having. Um, collapsing, giving into our society, giving into the pressures, giving into the world. Yep. All over the place. <laughs>